As Rabbi Wolner alluded to, this is Parashat Noah this week, the story of Noah and the flood. And it is, as I don't need to tell you, one of the most famous stories in all of our Torah. It is, in addition to being famous, also terrifying. The story that we know so well focuses on the consequence, and that is to say, the flood, with relatively little said about the cause. But if we want to learn from this tale, it's worth considering what a world so far gone that destruction was the only outcome, what a world like that might have looked like. In the opening verses of the parasha, the Torah teaches the earth became corrupt before God, the earth was filled with Hamas, which is violence or lawlessness. When God saw how corrupt the earth was, for all flesh had corrupted its ways on earth, well, that, that is when God decided to speak to Noah and when the rain began to fall. Our traditional commentators offer some suggestions about what the Torah means by lawlessness and corruption. Barvanel notes that the wording corrupt before God and the earth was filled with lawlessness are two similar but yet different phrases, and he gleans from this that one phrase refers to sins against God and the other to sins against fellow human beings. This sinning was compounded, Forno teaches, by the fact that it was unpunished and thereby multiplied. When the owner cheats the workers, the workers will respond in kind. Bechor Shor teaches the people worshipped power rather than law. The biblical scholar Nahum Sarna notes that Noah is but one of many similar Mesopotamian flood stories, but there is one radical difference that sets this one apart. Unlike the epic of Gilgamesh and others, Noah is the only one with a clear moral component, the only one to ascribe a cause to the destruction. As Sarna goes on to explain, it means that in Jewish biblical theology, human wickedness, the inhumanity of man to man, undermines the very foundation of society. The pillars upon which rests the permanence of all earthly relationships totter and collapse, bringing ruin and disaster to mankind. Unlike the other stories, the flood didn't come about on account of the whims of the gods, but as a direct result of unchecked moral decay. Noah was given instructions on building a boat. In our day, in our world, it is not so simple. When evil forces take hold, there are three ways to respond. We can ignore it, we can fight it, or we can accommodate it. We are a few weeks away from the anniversary of the nationwide German pogrom, commonly known as Kristallnacht, officially known as Reichspogromnacht. I prefer that second word because the other, the one that we are more familiar with, took hold in the aftermath when people saw the shattered glass of Jewish businesses and synagogues and homes covering the streets, and instead of reacting with horror, they reacted with wonder and amazement at the beauty of it all. It looked like the streets were made of crystals. But what did the Jews see? They saw something else. They saw a society that had clearly and unambiguously rejected them. A society that had descended beyond any hope at reconciliation and redemption. Reich's pogrom knocked in 1938 was when the floodwaters began to roar. Hindsight puts us at a disadvantage because we know exactly what happened next. We know that all the hope was lost and that the only option was to try and get on a boat before the waters rose too high. But the people living through those times in Germany in the 1920s and the 1930s, they didn't know that. All they knew was what was around them at the time. All they knew was the climate was changing, the clouds were coming. Let us keep that in mind as we consider how people responded to these changes. Mein Kampf, Hitler's autobiography, was published in 1925. Despite its widespread popularity, which is no secret, there were many who criticized the book publicly. As just one example, in one review, the author took issue with the claim that Hitler made that Jews contributed nothing to Germany by naming at length German Jews prominent in all elements of society. And after going through the list in the review, he contradicts himself in a way by saying, why does this even matter? 
Could a society that for decades was excluded from all progress, education, and culture by the horrible cruelty of the ghetto be blamed if it hadn't brought forth a single person like this? Why does it matter if there are prominent Jews based on the way they had been treated for decades? What would we have expected? And yet, nonetheless, despite that, look at the accomplishments and achievements. The author who wrote this review was Johannes Staniak, a Catholic theologian. A researcher on Mein Kampf, Ottmar Plockinger, collected 51 critical reviews of the book that were published in its aftermath in the 1920s. Of those 51 that were critical, only one came from a Jewish newspaper. Rachel Strauss, a physician who emigrated to what was then Palestine, explains, we passed by the boxes of the Nazi newspaper. We didn't realize it was one of the most read papers in Germany at the time. We saw Mein Kampf, Hitler's book, on display in every bookstore. None of us Jews, none of us bought it. None of us read it. Evil comes, and if we ignore it, maybe, maybe it'll go away. We know that the words of 1925 resulted in the riots of 1938. But they, they did not know. We know what came after those riots. But they, they did not. We can imagine the conversations. Even if Hitler was serious, he couldn't just fire every Jewish professor who would teach the classes. Even if he was serious, you really think that people would just let this happen? Even if he was serious, there aren't enough prisons in all of Germany to hold half a million Jews. We are no wiser than those who came before us. We just know how their story ends. Along with fighting and ignoring comes the final option when confronting evil, and that is accommodation. As Germany descended into nationalism, foreigners were increasingly marginalized. Many of these foreigners were Jews, Jews of Slavic descent who came from the East, who came from Poland, who were seen as uneducated, uncultured, simple laborers, described in one publication as pitiful creatures of a not quite human level. That description of these people is not quite human. That description comes from a man named Max Neumann. He was the founder of an organization called Verband National Deutscher Juden. For those that don't know German, the translation would be the Association of German National Jews. Max Neumann, the one who referred to Jews from Poland as not quite human, was Jewish. I will be honest, I had never heard of Max, and you probably have not either, but I want to make it clear that he wasn't just some crackpot with a newsletter working out of a basement somewhere. Max Neumann was a lawyer who had been a former captain in the German army with multiple commendations. And his organization, the Association of German National Jews, it had 3,500 members. That's getting close to 1% of the German Jewish population. Now, that might not seem like a lot, but it is nearly 1% more Jews than I would have expected would be sympathetic to Nazism. When a boycott of Jewish businesses was announced by the Nazi party in April 1933, it was Neumann and other similar groups, he was not the only one, who issued statements professing their love for Germany and condemning the wild agitation of Eastern European Jewish immigrants who, in Neumann's understanding, exploited the good German people and deserved the consequences. And it was the Association of German National Jews who, a year earlier in 1932, prior to parliamentary elections, encouraged Jews to, and I quote, ignore the regrettable side effects of Nazi anti-Semitism and join the National Socialists, even if they behave as if they are our enemies. In 1932, there was a Jewish organization led by a Jewish man with a membership filled exclusively of Jews who endorsed the Nazi party. How is this even possible? Hans Schopes, a Jewish historian of religion and a founder of a movement for Jewish children who were rejected from the Hitler youth. They wanted to be in it, but they were told they could not. 
In his writings, he found ways to minimize the contradictions. According to him, anti-Semitism was only a small part of what Nazism was actually about. The Holocaust historian Karl Reins writes that according to Schopes, National Socialism had simply projected everything that it hated on the abstract category that it called the Jew. In other words, when Nazism talks about Jews negatively, the term is just a stand-in for all of the shortcomings of society. Hitler doesn't actually mean Jews. It doesn't actually mean us. Do not underestimate the human ability to rationalize evil or to find ways to put self-interest above literally anything and anyone else. Maybe the rhetoric is a bit, bit tough, a bit rough, you might say, but, you know, he's got some really interesting economic ideas. So how did this all end? About how you would expect. Despite their argument that we Jews are different than those Jews and we hate them just as much as you do, that nuance, that was lost on the rabid racists of the Nazi party. Despite requested audiences with Hitler, a meeting never happened. Despite the attempts to reverse the ban on Jewish military service, Jews were not allowed to wage war on Hitler's behalf. But let us consider there were Jews who wanted to. And as one far-right newspaper concluded, these German national Jews are, quote, a monstrosity. Responding to evil by vilifying yourself is morally indefensible. But even then, even after selling your soul, at least in this case, it didn't even matter. By 1935, the Nazis had outlawed these Jewish groups and their members met the same fates as everyone else. Evil comes and goes from our world. We can fight it, we can ignore it, or we can become it. Our history does not make us immune from this last possibility. But those are our options. God has already told us there is no point in building another boat. If it's one thing we ought to remember, it's that history warps our perception because we know how these stories end. We know that the man described as a psychopath in the 1920s who was ranting about banishing people from society, psychopath or not, he did just that. And we know that the person who dehumanizes other people enough to say that we should just put them on a train and send them out of Germany to somewhere else, that a person like that does not care what happens to that train or the people on it once it leaves. If it's one thing we ought to remember, it's that when someone talks about dehumanizing human beings, we need to take them seriously. There is not going to be another flood. There is only us. And when evil comes into our midst, we have three options. We can ignore it, we can fight it, or we will become it. Can you hear Atzon? May it be God's will. <laughs>